NT right, you sneaky bugger, you. This is this is just a monstrous, monstrous, monstrous lie. Not a problem, guys. I worship you, Lord Jesus, for sending most of humanity to hell to burn forever. Oh, Jesus, it's it's climatic. Hello, this is Michael Beverly. Welcome to Truth Spotting Thursdays, a look at specific lies that apologists tell. It wasn't slavery as we think of that. When they're presenting the gospel, for example, chattel slavery is outlined in the Old Testament. There's no denying this. Each week, I'm going to pick one specific lie with a short clip. You and Bart Ehrman, another well-known uh, New Testament scholar, probably share the stage as the two most recognized names in New Testament studies. But clearly, you and he are on opposite ends of the theological spectrum. Um, while this may be a broad question, what's your response to Ehrman's assertion that there's very little we can say about the reliability of the New Testament in terms of knowing what the original manuscript said? As Ehrman famously says, all we have are copies of copies of copies, etc., which renders our ability to know what the original text says almost impossible. One of the great things about having copies of copies of copies is that we've got hundreds, thousands of manuscripts of the New Testament. Okay, telling a, the truth or making a truthful statement when your intention is to deceive, it's still a lie in my book. Now, maybe it's not technically a lie. I was just looking in the definition of lying and deception in the Stanford Encyclopedia, and there's like thousands and thousands of words about lying and deception and the morality and ethics of this we could have an eight-hour discussion and not solve anything but can we agree that if i tell you a truthful statement but my intention is to deceive you based on what you're actually asking me that that if it's not an actual lie, it's the same thing. It's an immoral or unethical deception. So if you suspect that your, that your spouse is cheating on you and your spouse says, oh, no, I wasn't cheating. I was with Michael. And then you ask me, and I know he was cheating or she was cheating. And, and instead of answering what I know you want to know, you know, do I have information or can I confirm the alibi? I say, oh, I was just talking to, you know, Joe or Mary yesterday. In fact, we were talking about Seinfeld. Oh, we had a great time. We were talking about Seinfeld and, oh, yeah, we had a great time. Yes, I, you know, we, we talked. And I leave it at that. But, and, and that could be true. Maybe we talked on the phone or maybe I ran into him in the hallway or at the grocery store. But I leave out all the rest of what you're actually asking me. Now, if maybe that's not technically a lie, but it's deception. So what N.T. Wright just said there technically is true. But guess what? How many Bibles do you think were printed this last year? I don't know. I Googled this because I was curious. It's like nobody really knows, but the estimate's in the range of, you know, a hundred million and the, and that the estimate of how many bibles exist in the world approaches like a billion so we have hundreds of millions of copies but guess what it's a non sequitur and it and nt's nt writes answer is essentially there it's essentially a lie because it's intended to deceive the audience and its intention whether whether he actually means, well, I don't know if he means to deceive people, but it's deceptive and it's wrong because it doesn't matter if we have a trillion copies. It really doesn't matter. I'm going to pause this really fast and then I'm going to, I'm going to read something and I'm going to prove my point. Here is John chapter one, verse one. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was a God. Now, this is, this is, of course, from the Jehovah's Witness Bible, which whenever the door just knocked, the dogs went crazy, and they heard the word Jehovah's Witness. So I have to pause for a minute. Okay. That wasn't Jehovah's Witnesses at the door. It was my girlfriend with dinner. And silly dog's with me now. He's going to help out. What do you think, silly dog? Hmm? He's, he's being a good boy. Um, 
Okay, where where were we before we got interrupted by the dogs going crazy was we were talking about the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Now, Christians, evangelicals will rightly point out that this is not an accurate translation because they added the word a. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was a God. And the point here, I hope the light bulb's starting to go on. That one little article, A, changed this theology drastically. Now, if, if a Jehovah's Witness were to say to you, look, in 1961, we printed a million copies of this book, and we faithfully copied this book, where there's now tens of millions or hundreds of millions of copies of this Bible. Are you, are you get, is the light bulb coming on? It doesn't matter if the Jehovah's Witness print a billion, trillion, gazillion copies. The air, like assuming, I assume everybody here except Jehovah's Witnesses agree this was in, this is, this was a change. But NT Wright's claim that there's thousands and thousands of copies is the same bullshit is if a Jehovah's Witness says I have a hundred billion copies. There's billions of Bibles printed that doesn't testify to the veracity of the original text being copied accurately. Do you get me here? Like, it's one thing if M.T. Wright wanted to be honest or any other apologist wanted to be honest, they would say the truth. The truth is what Bart Ehrman says. We don't know what the originals said. We don't. Now, it's fine if you're an apologist and you want to say, I take it on faith that the copies of the copy 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 over a hundred years or whatever it took was faithful. And the and then once we got the printing press and now that our common, you know, our common Bible now, whether it's you know, whether it's American Standard or the NIV or is 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 reasonably faithful to the original text because I have faith that all of those copies of 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 copies never once introduced a significant theological error on accident or on purpose. Right. So when we look at the Jehovah's Witness Bible, we know they did this on purpose. Jesus, they needed Jesus to be a God and not the God because they they don't believe in the Trinity. How do you know that in the year 102 or 150 or 92 or whatever, that somebody didn't do the same thing the Jehovah's Witnesses did? And it would be a lot harder to notice because they were writing these, you know, they didn't have a printing press back then. They were, how do you know somebody didn't make, like, like, let's, let's play devil's advocate. Maybe the Jehovah's Witnesses are right. And the article A was back in their original text. And somebody, when they were deciding to make the Trinity said, dude, we can't have this article in here. We need to take that out. Maybe the Jehovah's Witness Bible is actually right. Now, I, I'm not saying that but maybe it is how would you know so what Bart Ehrman is saying and it's, it's it, I hope this is obvious to you what Bart Ehrman is saying and the reason I'm calling N.T. Wright out here for lying in the sense that he's deceiving his audience is it doesn't matter if there's a million bajillion copies what matters is do we have a faithful copy of the original, and what Bart says is we don't know. Almost all the other texts from the ancient world we know only through one or two medieval manuscripts. Lucretius, the great Epicurean poet from the first century BC, his work was lost completely, discovered in one manuscript in 1417 by Poggio Bracciolini, and that has revived Epicurean mm. studies. That one manuscript, excuse me, we've got all these manuscripts of the New Testament going way, way back. And the fact that we've got copies of copies of copies means that we can jolly well go back to a very solid basis, much more solid than for any other ancient texts, whether it's Homer and Virgil, whether it's Caesar and Cicero, whether it's Seneca or Suetonius. 
not a problem, guys. No, N.T. Wright, it is a problem. And here you're just outright lying. First of all, it's a non sequitur that of other ancient texts that we don't have good copies. It doesn't matter. Nobody is preaching a gospel or telling people who they can have sex with or what foods they can eat, or how much money they have to give or who they should vote for. Nobody is telling people that based on the Iliad. Nobody is going around and saying, Euripides said such and such in a tragedy, so you need to not sleep with anyone except your wife and not have premarital sex or, you know, and abortion's wrong and we should go to war against Saddam Hussein or whatever. Like, no, so it's a complete non sequitur. Now, let's imagine, let's just imagine tomorrow some archaeologist or somebody in an old library discovers the Iliad or the Odyssey or um, any other old text from, you know, works of any of the Greek philosophers that he just mentioned or anybody else. And they find an old, they find an old text and it turns out there was a bunch of changes. Like somebody comes out and says, oh, all of you guys that have been reading Marcus Aurelius meditations, guess what? You know, 20% of that was changed. It was corrupted. Okay, yeah, that would be it would be super interesting, fascinating news, and it, and people that study this stuff would probably have debates and arguments about it. But like nobody's gonna have to change the their church affiliation or their faith or you know if 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 we found if we found out that that something different about Helen of Troy, like it's not gonna affect anyone's life. So this is a non sequitur. It doesn't matter that that other old texts weren't copied as much. And part of the reason that you have all the copies of of you know these thousands of copies that he's talking about is once the church became like an official institution and it had donations and money and it had you know popes and bishops and then and then governments and you know starting with emperors but then going on to kings and so forth. There was there was a lot of energy, time, and money spent on making copies of of books. Obviously, so if somebody commissioned Bibles to be copied for their church, I, you know, I don't know exactly how it went, but I would imagine there was a rich guy in the year five hundred or the year one thousand or whatever, and he's he's like, you know, well, here's some money so we can make we can make Bibles for you know, my parish or whatever. Well, there, that wasn't happening for these other Greek guys. Like, no, like there wasn't the same thing going on for Homer or the, anybody else. Like, so it, it, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Now it is the argument that we're, that we have, since we have more copies of the Bible, we can be more, we can be feel more secure that the copies are, accurate reflections of the earliest text that we have more so than for Greek philosophers. No problem. No, is anyone arguing that? Like, who cares? I mean, it would be great if we dug up some stuff and we had like a Dead Sea Scrolls moment for some of these old writings of, you know, Greek philosophers or whoever or or, or literature. Like, if we found some if we found some documentation that gave us a more clue like we don't even know if Homer was a real person or if it's like a bunch of poets and bards got together and these collections of you know became the Iliad and the Odyssey and so forth and but from various sources like like this is stuff is way too far in the past i imagine we dug up some ancient treasures um an ancient library and we were able to like that would all be wonderful everybody and everybody that studies this kind of stuff would be ecstatic about it it would be great but it's not going to change somebody's world view in terms of how they live their life and so forth so it's not these are different domains so again it's a non sequitur and essentially anti right is lying now why do these christian apologists have to lie Let's quit lying be honest can't your faith stand up to honesty, N.T. Wright? Do you feel that you have to lie for Jesus? I don't understand that. Because you know Bar Ehrman is right. We don't know 
what the original copies were, are the copies of 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 the copies. Of the copies. Um, and I think Bart, actually, Bart Ehrman would have to admit, yes, the New Testament text is pretty secure. Of mm. course, there are one or two passages where we say, not quite sure if this bit was originally part of the text or not. It may have come in, mm. somebody may have added a gloss, or somebody may have accidentally missed a bit out. N.T. Wright, you sneaky bugger, you. This is this is just a monstrous, monstrous, monstrous lie. You are lying. When you say even Bart would have to admit, what you're talking about is a non sequitur to the discussion. And the question that the caller or emailer that started this, like I didn't cut out the question. That's how the format. I'll put a link to the actual original video. If you want more, but basically the questioner is asking, like, how do we know? How do we know what the original said? I, like, because Bart Ehrman's opinion is different from N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright, you're lying here because when you say even Bart would have to admit that the copies that we have are faithful, you're not answering the question. The question was about the originals, which is Bart's exact point is the opposite of what you're just saying. If you were to say to Bart. Hey, Bart, if we look at the earliest reliable copies of the Gospel of Mark or John or whatever, Paul's letters, and we compare those to the copies in 300 and 400 and 500 and all the way to King James and all the way now to the NIV, are those reasonably faithful? And, it, and when there's minor changes is something he's going to talk about next. When there's minor changes, you know, we can see them. We can go back to the to the earliest Greek copies that we have. And what would Bart Ehrman say to that? Well, like like what N.T. Wright is saying is, well, even Bart Ehrman would agree. Well, yeah, if you pull an, an, a text out that is a faithful, that's been faithfully copied, obviously Bart Ehrman's not gonna say, oh no, that's not faithfully copied. But that's not the point Bart's making. He's not saying that this is a faithful copy of this. He's saying this exists at a certain time, let's just say 150 CE or 120, it doesn't matter. We have this, we have this copy here in time, and this is we're not arguing that from here to here is a faithful reproduction. In fact, it wouldn't matter if it was a hundred percent Xerox, because just like with the Jehovah's Witnesses, do you think the Jehovah's Witness Bible that was printed yesterday? is different from the one printed in 1961. I imagine it's exactly the same. So if we go back to the year, whatever, 130, 140, whatever it is, I, I don't know the exact dates and it doesn't matter. If we go back to that time and you say to Bart Ehrman or any other scholar, hey, are these pretty close? He, well, okay, yeah. So what? It's a non sequitur. That's not what's being asked. What's being asked is what did the original say? And what errors or theological changes on purpose or mistakes were made between the original writing you know like somebody now i know apologists say it was really mark matthew and luke but th even that doesn't matter for my point here it doesn't matter if it was if it was john mark following jesus around and he knew perfect greek and he was writing actually jesus he was he he was a stenographer it, it even if that was the case you don't have that paper. You don't. And you don't have the next copy or 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 the next copy. Or the next copy. And I'm going to stop now, but I could do this for another hour. You don't have any of those copies. The first copy that you have, if that's faithful, faithfully reproduced, it doesn't matter because we don't know what the original was. We don't. So... That doesn't mean it's not possible, Christians. I'm like I'll admit this. It doesn't mean that God couldn't have inspired all the copyists to do a perfect job and that God inspired the actual books that made it to the canon to not be the ones where everybody lied and made up stories like, you know, all the apocryphal and non-canon books and all the stuff we know, like everybody agrees is not true. Come on. Can, can you guys be honest about this? Again, why does your faith require lies to sell? All manuscripts are like that. When, when I write a book and somebody copy edits it, that, that happens now as yeah. well. Doesn't it, mean it, I didn't write it. Are you saying, N.T. Wright, that if 
an editor made an error or a change to your work that changed the meaning that you would stand by that claim that that doesn't mean you didn't write it if an editor made a change or an, an error that in change that changed the intention of what you said like in the Jehovah's Witness example, adding the article A, which is just a minor little change, completely changes changes the meaning of that verse. It has huge, significant theological ramifications. So again, you're arguing here with either non sequiturs or, or hand waving to get people off of what the real question is. So What's interesting is you're admitting that even in today's modern time with computers and word processing and the checks and balances that we have in modern publishing, there's still errors and mistakes. And yet you want us to believe that for 100 or 200 years that copy is copying by hand, including a lot of people that we know for a fact that there was a lot of Christians that didn't mind forging and writing things and changing things for theological purposes like we know this is true we know we know some of the letters attributed to paul weren't written by paul and and we know that there's 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 undeniable conflicts between the gospels and paul's letters which theologians today and apologists today have to rectify by sometimes coming up with some inventive word salads we, so we know stuff we know stuff could easily have been copied wrong or changed on purpose back then and we would have no way of knowing and you're admitting these kind of things still happen today the difference being with email and computer and pdfs and word documents it, it's a lot harder for stuff like that to get through and it's a lot easier to see when something has been you know, where an error has been introduced, whereas that wasn't the case back then. And we have this giant dark period where we simply don't have the copies. So these these Thursday, these, this Thursday series about called truth spotting is to call out lies by apology. And N.T. Wright, there's you you're lying and lying and, and you're compounding it with lies because you're you're taking an honest question by somebody and you're giving them an answer that's deceptive and you're trying to lead them to an answer that is false because the question really centers on do we how do we know when Bart Ehrman says we have all these copies of copies of copies of copies how do we know what the original said and then every answer that NT writes given is either a non sequitur or a lie or a truth that's that is being used to deceive to deceive the hearer because it because it's not answering the actual question it, in my experience having done a few of my unbelievable shows with with Bart Ehrman as well i was interested actually when i did sit down to debate this particular issue with him uh, across with another mm -hmm. bible scholar that actually it turned out there were relatively few really contested yes. issues yes. and even in the ones where there were it was contested whether jesus felt pity or was angry yes, when he yes, s yes, saw yes. such and such. Well, Bart had an opinion on which it was. He, yes, he felt yes. we could actually know yes, which yes, it yes, was. Yes. So, right, so in a sense, right. it doesn't, when you actually get down to brass tacks, it doesn't quite seem as mis mystifying as, no, as, as it it's sometimes presented. it's not nearly presented. as much of a problem as people sometimes think. I think... Well, again, with the lies, and in this case, he, he's essentially, he's essentially slandering Bart Ehrman here because he's mixing two different things. When When he says that Bart Ehrman has an opinion on what the text meant in terms of these these things that are contested what they're base they're basically admitting there's some minor things and this is what apologists do when uh, I mean the, the the greatest one to me is when Mike Lacona debated Bart Ehrman and said if you're there if you're there with a video camera on the at the day of you know the the res the or excuse me the crucifixion you're you're videotaping in Jerusalem there's not going to be any zombies on the video so Bart says well okay so you're admitting there's an error and Michael Kona says no no that that's not an error well you so you don't believe in the zombies when Michael Kona says no like I don't I don't believe that literally happened but it's not it's not an error so these little things that people argue about and and what he's saying that Bart like I don't know. What conversation they're talking about so the, a little bit of this is conjecture on my part but it sounds to me like bart ehrman's giving his opinion on 
what he felt the text means as it stands, as as Bart or anyone else can read it, we can make like I can do that as an atheist. I can read stuff and I can say, well, it sounds to me like once save, always saved is true. Or it sounds to me like, um, you know, Jesus turned water into wine at a at a big party. So Jesus is fine with people getting a little tipsy. Or if Bart Ehrman has an opinion, a scholarly, I mean, it's certainly worth paying attention to. He's he's a brilliant scholar, but when 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 you're presenting that Bart Ehrman, what what's in that conversation? They just that little clip they just had. They're presenting it as if Bart Ehrman's admitting that these are just minor errors and that they can probably be worked out. But that that has this has nothing to do with Bart's position on the copies of 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 the copies. Of the copies. It has nothing to do with the actual question that was asked. The question's about Bart's opinion on how do we know what the originals were? Like, like how do we? How can we take the Bible we have today as being reliable in the sense that the original text in the Christian view was an ins it was inspired, but then it was copied and copied and copied, and we don't have any of those originals. So. That whole last little conversation was just a complete smokescreen. It's hand-waving and it's lying and it's slanderous. I mean, I don't know Bart very well. I've been on panels with him and debate, debated with him here and there. And we once did, a, I think, a podcast debate um, some years ago. But um, he comes from, as he t says frequently, a very, very, very conservative Christian background. Which that was his then, original background. Which, which yeah. he then threw over mm -hmm. for whatever reason. But in that very narrow, restricted background, it's basically all or nothing. You either have every single syllable of the Bible is literally true or... If the glass cracks, the glass cracks. All right. This would be a whole nother video. I could spend an hour discussing how ridiculous the stuff that he's just saying here. Essentially, he's accusing Bart Ehrman of coming from a totally fundamentalist position. And then once Bart found out some things were wrong about the Bible, he just threw it all out with the bathwater. Like I've listened to, I listened to Bart's story. Um, one of the best ones I think was done an interview with Lawrence Krauss and they talked about this a lot. Bart Ehrman didn't wake up one day and become an atheist or an agnostic atheist because they're because the glass cracked. So N.T. Wright is not only a liar, he's slandering Bart Ehrman again. I highly challenge you if you're if you're a Christian, if you're thinking about deconstructing, or I mean you're going through it, or you're thinking about questioning things, go listen, go look up the Lawrence Krauss Bart Ehrman interview or listen to some of other other talks with Bart Ehrman to see the actual, the truth, instead of this slanderous bullshit by somebody who should know better. Like this is a highly respected Christian author and, you know, uh, you know, he's, he's a, he's a, a big Anglican with a lot of respect and tons of books and here, you know, he can just casually throw out slanderous bullshit. Why? Well, because Christianity is obviously so weak that these guys have to lie. So the 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 irony here is what N.T. Wright is saying, hey, look, I can deal with these problems in the text. It's not a big deal to me. And that people that are that take it seriously are just stupid. That's kind of what he's saying. But that's not what happened with Bar Ehrman. And I would agree with N.T. Wright that if you f you found a minor transcribal error that that would be an illogical reason to not be a christian anymore that but that's kind of what he's accusing bar ehrman of doing and the reason they say this is it's a defense so listening to the elisa lisa childers tim burnett uh, book tour about the deconstruction this is the big thing in christianity these days no 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 we we we're gonna accept evolution's true and we're going to accept that there's there's some minor errors and we're going to we're going to accept that maybe women can be pastors or maybe homosexual marriages can be black. like we're going to accept all those things but don't leave the church oh please please nt right needs his pension to be funded come on guys i'll throw it out just cuz you found a lot of errors i mean it's really it, 
it's really at the end of the day, it's really disgusting. And, and you know, I as I went through this through this again, any respect I had for for these guys just is down here to zero because it's just they come across as they come across as being you know, honest apologists and honest, you know, Christians who, you know, believe in, you know, supposedly don't lie. And then their whole spiel is just filled with lies and slander and half truths. Come on. If you're a Christian, you ought to be ashamed of this kind of stuff. Um, and it's like, actually, some very traditional Catholics who, if the Pope is wrong on one issue, he's quite possibly wrong on everything. Well, if you're raised in a system where you're told what that, you know, the when the Pope speaks as God's vicar and he in, in that speech, he's inspired, he's basically speaking for God. And then it turns out what he said was full of shit. Then isn't it fair, N.T. Wright, for people to say, yeah, that seems to be a pretty good proof that the whole thing's a bunch of bullshit. What you seem to be saying is, hey, guys, when you go to the used car lot and you're going to buy a used car and you catch the used car salesman completely lying about something, it's okay, little boy. It, that was just one lie. The car is still probably good and the used car salesman, he's probably a nice guy. Come on. What, what, you're, what you're trying to say is, if you're a little child and you find out that Santa Claus is not real, that you should, that, you know, you're saying don't throw out everything your parents tell you because you found out Santa Claus isn't real. And if that's what you were saying, I would agree with you because Santa Claus is a fun story and kids get it. Like, generally speaking, I think kids go oh yeah that and then it, it you know if it's the oldest son or the oldest daughter you say don't tell your brother and sister they still enjoy and when kids get a little bit older i, I mean i'm i'm not saying this has never happened for for the most part kids don't carry a lifelong resentment at their parents for telling this santa claus story it's a fun you know it's a fun fantasy right that is completely completely different so he N.T. Wright's trying to sell it like that, but that's like that's not the point, dude. The point is, is people are raised in the Catholic Church to have an immense respect for the priests and the bishops and the archbishops and the pope. And when it turns out those motherfuckers are concealing uh, child molester pedophiles in their line, and they and they, you know, they were sycophants for the nazis in, in during world war ii and god knows what other disgusting horrible things that the catholics are guilty of when you discover that that is good grounds to say okay yeah it's all bullshit it's all complete bullshit like if you're a catholic and you look at all that stuff and just excuse it all then you're just being a little bit naive in my opinion i think you're being very naive actually and i think what you support is evil but what what N.T. right there is accusing Bart Ehrman of doing is saying, oh, he's like these Catholics who find out the Pope said something or did something wrong and they want to throw out everything. But that's not how it works. Like he's trying he's trying to equate the Pope making a mistake with the with the fantasy that you would tell your child about Santa Claus. And those things are not they're not analogous at all. They're completely different. One is just a fun story. You tell your kids. And they get a little bit older and you and then you admit, yeah, you know, I would hardly even call that a lie. I mean, I when when my kids were younger, I would I I really didn't like Santa Claus. Like I didn't I didn't make a big production about Santa Claus because I, I felt it was dishonest. Maybe I was a little bit uptight, but whatever it like my kids still had great Christmases. And I think they figured out pretty early on the presents came from mom and dad like it wasn't a big deal but there's other kids that get more into santa and those kids when they find out santa isn't real they get it it's 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 a fun myth it's fun to wake up on christmas and open your present that santa brought you that's completely not the same as this pope thing when you find out the pope was lying to you 
that's a complete different story and you should leave the Catholic Church as fast as your feet can carry you when you figure out that the popes and the bishops are hiding child molesters and lying and stealing money and doing all this other corrupt stuff. And when Bart Ehrman discovered that he'd been lied to by the church and things had been hidden from him and that other pastors that went through seminary knew about these things that they don't tell the congregation. He said, wait a minute. And eventually Bart Ehrman deconstructed. It didn't happen when he saw a crack in the glass like N.T. Wright just tried to make it sound. So stop lying, N.T. Wright. Stop spreading libelous or slanderous things about people who have deconstructed. And be freaking honest. Be honest. Is that too much to ask of a Christian apologist and a you know a somebody that that comes across as as a well spoken respected man of you know man of God that you have to be a liar? Come on, stop lying. Um, now I've never lived in that kind of of of, of sharply defined narrow world. I've never had to break out of it. Um, I have been able to make my way as a historian, as a believer, and to look at the texts and the big picture and, and find, kind well, of find to, my way. To give him his due, I think Bart has told me in his own journey that he sort of went on a journey, yeah, which took yeah. him out of that. And I think the thing that really took him away from faith altogether was eventually the problem of evil. And that perhaps is a different issue yes, well, altogether. Uh, he, he and I debated that, um, oh, 10 years ago, actually. Right. Um, oh, I remember they, you did it on the Pathios Network, I have a feeling. Quite possibly. Yes. It was in San Francisco, I right. know, which was an odd occasion. Yeah. Um, and it was actually quite difficult to debate him. Uh, debating Bart, um, you sort of make a point and then he comes at you from a different angle. It's like <laughs> it's like kicking a football against a haystack. It doesn't bounce back <laughs> the way you expect it. Yes, N.T. Wright, we know that you don't live in a world in which evidence and facts matter. That's why you're a Christian. We get that. But to, but to slander somebody because they do care about facts and evidence is despicable. And then the host here goes on to say, well, I think, I think to be fair, Bart Ehrman, Bart Ehrman left Christianity due to the problem of pain. Now, this is a little bit more charitable, but it's still not the truth. Now, I've listened to Bart speak, as I mentioned before. And again, I recommend his interview with Lawrence Krauss. Um, I think it's called the Origins Podcast. And Lawrence Krauss says in that, it says, hey, my podcast is about origins. Tell me about your childhood. So you get a, a bigger story of, of Bart's history. And, and when you listen to Bart, you will, you will hear quite clearly that the reason he left Christianity isn't just one thing. It wasn't the problem of pain. It wasn't a crack in the glass of Christianity. It was the combination of all of these things, which most of us who are, you like to think that we're thinking people, like I don't, I like to think I'm a thinker and I'm, you know, even if you disagree with my conclusions, come on, I'm not stupid. I thought about this stuff. And most of us who came out of Christianity, like myself, thought about these things and continue to think about these things. And we didn't just wake up one day and say, oh, there's a problem with Mark chapter seven. I am not a Christian anymore. That would be silly. Nor would we say, there's a, there's a problem with pain. I'm not convinced by theodicy, so I quit. No, it's it's usually the combination of those things that, that we can't reconcile the problem of pain and suffering and the doctrine of hell with the things in the Bible that either don't make sense or can't possibly be real history or have so many problems it adds up to this is man-made. And then we look at the evidence and, you know, if you're really into this stuff, you start looking at the evidence from quantum physics and theoretical phys physicists guys like Lawrence Krauss, and you say, okay, I don't need to rely on the theory that, that there's a creator God. Naturalism could be true. Now, does that mean I know naturalism is true? Well, no, but it, it gives me possibilities to think about. And then when I compare the world that I see with this Christian idea of a just, loving, caring father, come on. It's obvious that God's not a just loving father unless unless you just twist all the words to mean something different. Like 
God's a loving, just father, even though most people suffer and go to hell, that's how he wanted it to be. Like if you're a Calvinist, you say, look, God, God made all these people to go to hell and God's good and everything he does is good. So people, most people going to hell is good, but not, but I'm going to heaven. Woohoo! Woohoo! God chose me. Woohoo! And I'm at a party and I'm going to look down on all you suckers burning in hell and I'm going to praise Jesus. Praise Jesus for those people suffering. I want them to burn and suffer and feel pain for eternity. And I'm going to praise the sweet Jesus at the at the great feast of the Lord and the Lamb of God. Thank you. Oh, Jesus, thank you that women and children will suffer forever. Thank you, Jesus. I worship you, Lord Jesus, for sending most of humanity to hell to burn forever. Oh, Jesus, it's it's climatic. It's amazing, Jesus, thinking of all of the people, the Jews, the Jews burning in hell. Oh, Jesus, that almost, oh, that makes me feel so good inside. All the Muslims going to hell, all the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, all those people that didn't believe the right doctrine, which me, because I am smart enough to see that the right interpretation of the Bible and God chose me. Oh, Lord, it's it's so sweet, Lord Jesus, the the suffering and the torture of all of those, especially the ones that died when they were young. Um. Yeah, excuse me, guys. I, I, I got to go get a picture of Jesus and masturbate to this because it's so glorious. Because I can't think of anything better than, than feeling a climatic orgasm while I imagine all of those people burning in hell. Come on. Think of how disgusting your theology is if you believe anything even close to this. And if you're a universalist, well, fine. Otherwise, it's just disgusting. That's it. I'm worn out. This Listening to these guys, I'm going to keep doing this, and I think this is important work to call out guys like N.T. Wright for being liars, slanderers, and deceivers. And I'm not going to stop doing it, and I hope you'll support me because this message needs to get out. These guys are liars. And and that and what they're selling is disgusting. All right, that's it for this one. I'll catch you on the other side. And I was just kidding about the masturbation thing. <laughs> <laughs>